Okay, it is three o'clock. We're going to get started with the study session. I don't know. Uh, Mr. Scragg, do you have anything or any, you want to do the introductions? Sure. I'd uh, try to do a couple of introductory things and then we'll uh, get started. Um, Commissioner Hodges is dialed in and uh, observing the presentation uh, remotely um, for COVID reasons. And Commissioner Franz is not in attendance, nor is he dialed in. Um, he will be dialing in uh, at four o'clock for the regular meeting. He, he he shared that he worked outdoors and and uh, has allergy symptoms, but doesn't want to cause any concern about uh, whether those might relate to to COVID. So he's uh, out of an abundance of caution, going to dial in as well. So the study session presentation topic today is the. Uh, Global Aeronautics Initiative at K-State Polytechnic. Um, as a little bit of recap, you, uh, commissioners may re recall that we had some conversation, I don't even know how long ago at this point. Over a but, year ago. Uh, over a year ago about uh, possible development of the K-State campus and, uh, and the pursuit of a Global Aeronautics Initiative program. And uh, President Myers from the main campus uh, came and presented to you at one point about the university's commitment to, to this initiative. There was a recognition then that they, the university really wanted to take a hard look at, at what the options might be and develop a strategic plan going forward. So Dr. Alicia Starkey is here with us today from uh, K-State Polytechnic to give us an update on kind of the outcome of that effort. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Starkey. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, was, I was thinking on the way here, it's been a little bit over a year ago. I think it was in September of last year that we came and gave the presentation <laughs> and the update for the Global Aviation Initiative. And so then um, our campus, as was the world, we call it the great disruption of 2020, kind of took over um, and we had to pause that conversation a little bit. But since this summer, we've been working really hard as a campus, taking a closer look at that Global Aviation Initiative in the context of what it means for our campus, what it means for Salina and what it means for K-State. And we're pretty excited here to, to share with you the, conver the continuing conversation we've had around that context for our campus and, and where we are right now. This would not have been possible without the partnership of our community partners, the investment by the city, as well as the county, the Economic Development Corporation, the Airport Authority, NK State, really giving us an opportunity to sit down and look at our history of our campus and what it's meant to Salina but then also delve a little bit more into the future of what our campus is now that we've got four institutions of higher learning in Salina. Um, how do we differentiate ourselves? And then how do we, we kind of came through this evolution of where we first served as kind of everything to all people as a two-year college and a four-year college in Salina. And as other colleges have come on board, how do we start differentiating ourselves as well as taking this global aviation initiative and really legend, leveraging it not only for what it could do for our college, but also what it can do for Salina. And so that conversation has continued about how do we make Salina, not just our college, a hub of global aviation. And that's what's driven these conversations to date. So picking up where we left off about a year ago, um, this was the call to action from the Global Aviation um, Initiative Report. And you can see um, through those, K-State leadership, as Mike had said, they have taken this by the, by the reins and said, okay, this is something K-State wants to accomplish. We have a commitment to the Global Aviation Initiative and to the campus in Salina, Kansas. That was something that we've been eager to hear from K-State for about 20 years. They're so committed to it, they've made aviation one of the four strategic initiatives that the campus or that the university will tackle over the next 10 years. And that's a pretty big statement from the university to say this campus is so important to our university system Salina as a co-host of one of our campuses is so important to our university. We're gonna invest a lot of leadership and a lot of attention on the field of aviation. That was exciting. Um, we needed to hire an innovative leader. We did do that. We brought Lindsay Dryling on board. She has a lot of great experience at the state and the federal level to help us um, leverage this uh, global aviation initiative as best as we can. And then where we're at right now is really focusing on those two bottom bullets. Um, the additional resources that we need to fulfill this initiative, as well as the vision for the polytechnic campus <coughs> within K-State ecosystem. So in our conversations, we've kind of come to realize that in order for us to realize this global success and to grow our global prominence in the field of aviation, 
we really need to merge our institutional vision and our institutional mission with the Global Aviation Initiative. As a campus of 600, maybe we want to double that in size. We're too small to have two competing missions and visions that we really need to combine these and put all of our effort into this Global Aviation Initiative and just really lean hard into what does it mean to serve the aviation industry. So this was the vision from the Global Aviation Initiative and we're just gonna stick and adopt that vision for our entire campus. Our campus in general will be a global leader in aviation innovation and talent development. No distinction between this initiative and our campus. This right now, we are living this vision and this is what we will continue to live for the future. With that being said, we will focus on these areas. Our areas of strength for the campus will be in manned aviation. That's probably a given, if you think about our history on campus and what we, what we do. Um, unmanned systems. Last time we were here, we talked about manned aviation as well as unmanned aircraft systems. We're, we're broadening that a bit to focus on the entirety of unmanned systems. As you look at the transportation industry, it's not just unmanned aircraft systems that we expect are gonna take off through this technology that impacts aviation. You're looking at ground transportation, as well as underwater transportation, robotics, automation, that's all huge in unmanned systems and what's gonna drive the future of our technology industries. As well as advanced manufacturing. That's key not only for our campus, and we have critical strengths within our faculty in that area, but it's key for Salina. And we realize in this that we have to find those pillars that not only support the aviation industry, but cross over and help to support the community as well too. And if you look at our technology industries here in, in Salina, you have Schwann's, which is huge right now. We're developing an apprenticeship program with them for our students and to help serve their workforce needs. As well as CASA, Vortex, um, Coperion, those are all huge manufacturing agencies that we want to continue to serve for the region. Those three pillars of strengths that we have identified with will always be based on the foundation with um, critical attention being paid to safety, innovation, entrepreneurship, and diversity. We've seen a lot of, particularly in the areas of unmanned systems, a lot of spinoff companies from our students who graduate and go on to create companies, many of who are still located right here in Salina. And so that's an area that we need to focus and develop for our students as well as for our community partners here in Salina. So as I mentioned before, if you take a good long look at our history from 1965 when we started a, Sh a Schilling Air Force Base, we really feel this new vision for campus coalescing with the Global Aviation Initiative not only honors the past of where our campus has been and that um, winding road of development we've had, but it also serves the present. And Kansas State University is a land-grant institution. And as a land-grant institution, we have the responsibility to serve the state of Kansas. And so these are the four critical industries within the state of Kansas, and this vision aligns well to four of those key industries. Aerospace, logistics, um, automation, and I can't see that last one to know what it was. Oh, and is it environmental? can't see it either. I know, I was like, um, and part of this vision does talk about the renewal, renewable uh, energies and, and reusing of, of materials in the aviation industry so we're not creating additional waste for the industry as we move forward. Um, but four of those seven key areas are identified within this vision so it allows us to continue to serve um, the state of Kansas as well as continue to serve our key partners here in Salina. And then it also helps us to design our future. We've been, we've had the same degree program since 1965 for the majority of the time that we've been here. We haven't veered too far from those initial programs when we stopped um, serving as Schilling Air Force Base, those programs that we inherited. And it's time for us to kind of take a hard look and say, okay, what do our partners, not only in the region as well as in the state, but globally need for us to be able to achieve this vision? So we intend to do that through a three-pronged approach, a framework to, to accomplishing this vision. Innovation in education, changing the way we think about education. We know as we come out of this pandemic, people are gonna wanna consume education differently. They live differently. They're gonna, they're gonna wanna go about their lives a little bit differently than what they did before. We have to make sure that we're reaching people where they are and that we're innovating in everything that we do. 
influential research, as well as talent development. Those are the three key areas that we'll focus on moving forward to realize this vision. And I'm not gonna go into each one of these um, because you have this in front of you, but I'll just touch on a few of those key areas that I think are important. I talk a little bit about looking at our diversity of the portfolio of the degrees that we offer. And so this is a pretty critical one for, to look at in the context of what does this mean for the community of Salina. So as we diversify and align our curriculum to serve the aviation industry, in many people's minds, you think about aviation as an airplane. And you think about manned aviation. And that's probably about 10% of the industry. 90% of the industry is business and engineering. And so the majority of our effort is gonna be probably in the areas of business and engineering as we look to diversify our curriculum. 10% is learning how to fly a plane and learning how to fix it. The innovation pieces and the connections to our industries here in Salina are in the other 90%. And so you can see through there, right now we have degree programs in engineering technology, which are still relevant, but we're gonna create some niche areas within each of those um, in the areas of sensors and controls. Robotics is a huge one. That's what we're working on with uh, Schwann's right now is that a robotics apprenticeship. We have a new degree coming out in machine-based learning. How does artificial intelligence play into everything that we do right now? That's a critical concept in aviation, but it's also huge in all of the other components that we serve. Big data management, technical communications, how do you communicate between the ground and the sky in a lot of different areas? We haven't really touched on that before. Um, and cybersecurity, that's another area. How do you keep that data secure when it's in the sky? Um, so these are the, the main areas where you'll see some expansion in our offerings and where we anticipate growing our campus in the future. And then I talk about a little bit about the innovations that we'll experience on the educational si side, um, just making sure that we've got stackable strategic partnerships that we're leveraging those to expand our national footprint. As many of you may know, We've been in conversations for quite some time with General Atomics. Um, and so we're visiting with them as well as Textron and getting great support from our community members to bring the Kansas Simulation Center as an example of that partnership with uh, General Atomics that um, the Airport Authority as well as the County Economic Development Group is interested in helping us with. It's an example of how we want to leverage those strategic partnerships to benefit Salina, not just the university. Um, and then real life experiential learning. I talked about how we want to bring apprenticeships to our local partners here in the community. So Swans right now with their major expansion, they know that they need to um, have higher individuals with a different skill set than what they have right now. And so we're working with the state as well as Swans on a couple of different grants to, to um, bring them apprenticeships in which our students will learn while they're on their field. It's different than internships, which you typically do outside of the curriculum. These will be embedded into the curriculum and most of the learning will happen on the job. So we're looking to expand those into other areas. This will be a key central component of our high school academy that we're starting next year. So our goal with the high schools is that we can train students while they're in high school for these high skill tech jobs that our community needs right now. They'll work for those community partners while they're in high school and they'll graduate high school with an associate's degree, not just a technical certificate, but an associate's degree. They can either go on to the four-year program or if they want to enter directly into the workforce, they'll be skilled and educated, also embedded into a culture of one of our industry partners here in Salina that they can walk right in and be productive from day one. So that's one of the examples of what we're doing with this new vision here. Um, and then the other component is we all know, because we've learned this as a life lesson, but students do not know this. Um, this generation of students, which is used to getting a ribbon or a trophy for participation, is really, really scared of failure. And how do you get people comfortable with the fact that some of the greatest human achievements come through failure and trying again and, and not giving up after that at first initial component. And so that's one of the things that we're intentionally integrating into our experiences not when they're learning to fly a plane. <laughs> we don't want it there. <laughs> but through some of these other components of, of general education and in the technical components, how do, we, how do we help them fail in a way that lets them get comfortable with that? 
through research, this main component is that we want to define the industry problems. A lot of universities and researches um, in research, they're being reactive to something that's happened. We want to be out there in front of the problems. This is where unmanned systems is currently um, really kind of expanding their sphere of influence and how they help actually create the national standards for as unmanned aircraft systems get integrated into the national airspace. We don't want to wait for those standards to come about and then we learn to implement them. We, we want to be researching these for the FAA and helping them determine what are the national standards. And we've got three, three or four different faculty members right now who are helping to write those. We also have somebody sitting on the standards. Everybody remembers the Boeing 837 <laughs> certification issue and the, the, how they took the Boeing Maxes out of the airspace. We have a faculty member right now who's sitting on the federal board writing those standards, and so we'll have a new master's degree in aircraft certification. We'll be the first in the nation to have that when it comes out in fall of 2021. That's our sphere of influence that we want. We want to be at the table at the federal level helping to design these different standards for, for the FAA. And then I talk about reducing the environmental impact and how that fits to Kansas needs. There's a lot of metal that comes out of airplanes a lot of used materials that just go to die in a landfill. There's a lot of usable materials there if we can just learn to think about how we re-implement some of that material into other elements of life. And so this will be a major re uh, research focus for us is how do we repair, reuse, and recycle industry materials so we're not just contributing to the overall footprint of the nation and waste in those particular areas. And talent development is really just about nurturing passions throughout the entire lifespan, taking individuals from the time they first develop an interest in aviation or technology, helping them leverage that interest, seeing what they can do with it as a future career. But then after retirement as well too, helping people continue to um, live their passions so they don't, so they have something to do with their passions after they retire and can still remain active. So that's kind of where our vision sets. And this is where we get into what do we need and what are the gaps in the resources to help us realize that vision. This is where some of the, the reality sets in a little bit. Um, the first thing and our first priority as a campus is to, to identify and build a new academic facility. In 2013, we underwent the process of a campus master plan that built out the campus, and I'll show you a picture in a minute here of what that build out will look at, like um, if we can realize this vision. But the number one thing that we know that we need, we're dealing with um, infrastructure that was built in the 40s that was built by the military for a distinct cause, and it is inefficient. Um, and we really feel like with one new academic building, we can centralize our academic and research focuses here. Um, and take our campus footprint down from 19 buildings down to five. So our first goal is to get a new academic facility that we can co-locate everything that we do on campus in. Um, we've built this off of the College of Business in Manhattan and kind of the expectations of what that could look like. And that houses up to 4,000 students in one building. So we know that we've got plenty of growth space if we can realize this vision. We're also running out of housing for our students. We did have to rent out the new, um, the old St. John's campus this year in order to house our students because we outgrew our campus. Um, and so that would allow us to repurpose some of one of our existing buildings to apartments so we wouldn't have to build new apartments either. And then we're also outgrowing our, our flight operation space. Currently, um, we are about 30 students over capacity for what you should be for a flight operational program um, that's only expected to grow and so we quickly need to identify resources and facilities so we don't have to pull back a little bit on that throttle um, so we can continue to grow but we need to make sure remember that foundation is safety we need to make sure we're doing that on all in a safe environment before we grow so we're estimating this new facility would be about 50 million dollars to to erect I'm not sure if this group heard about the hangar refresh project either through the airport authority or through K-State at some point, but those hangars that are um, leading up to the, to the museum and the sculpture, um, all of us I think would like to see something done with those hangars after the investment the city and the airport authority put in. And so this is on our list as a major um, focus for us as well too is to refresh those hangars, 
redevelop those into research and corporate lease space. So as the airport authority and the city and the county are having conversations with um, uh, bringing employers to the community, we've got a place that we can co-locate those communities directly on the airport. They have, would have access to the ramp. They could also help um, work with our faculty to do co-research and other elements to help develop that area as well. When we looked at that before, that cost was about $15 million to, to refresh that hangar. And then with growth in our campus um, comes the need for students to have places where they can go. And right now I have just assigned my last office space on campus. I have no more office space for <laughs> anybody else to come um, without getting creative in how we, how we work. Um, and so we had, when we developed the Student Life Center it, 10 years ago, I think it was 2011 when we had that opening, um, we had a phase two plan for that and it's critical that we move to that phase two location so students have the, the areas that they need to to gather and do co-curricular development outside of the classroom. We anticipate that's about a $5 million expansion based upon 2011 numbers so I don't know what that would look like now. And then we just have other resource needs within our, within our programs. If we want to be globally prominent we know that we have to invest in robotics and automation. We have to invest in manned aviation, our fleet. That's our, that's our parallel, paralyzing element right now is we have no more airplanes to bring any more students on than what we have this year. It's a recruitment um, deterrent for us right now. We have to be able to expand our fleet and then integrate the advanced manufacturing technology as Schwantz is updating their technology and their smart technologies. Make sure that we've got the technologies to be able to serve not only our aviation partners but our partners in this line as well. So this is in your packet and I'll let you read it, but here's that picture of what our campus development could look like um, if we put all of our energies and efforts in here. That main road kind of there offset on the left, that's Magnolia. So currently you have to kind of dog leg to the right to get to our main entrance over there, but this would be, the main entrance would be straight off of Magnolia with the academic component of campus straight in front of that and then the student life and the housing component over to the right. Um, so this is where we kind of see some of that development happening as we continue to grow out campus. What I presented to you was about an $82 million investment, <laughs> which, is, which is a pretty big determinant. So we're getting ready to do a feasibility study to see is this even possible. Our alumni, our donors, um, you know they come from, most of them come from a two-year institution. And so their capability and their giving prospects aren't, aren't necessarily at that level that we would need to see for this. And so we do anticipate that this will be a multi-tiered funding approach, um, hopefully seeking some federal dollars, seeking you know, some partnerships maybe with the, with the city as well as the county and other elements to try to leverage some ways in which we can make this a reality. Um, so I think this is probably the first kind of episode of this plan revision that you guys may hear about as we move forward because um, there's critical components not only on the, the hangar refresh but on the new entry to campus and the other elements that the city will need to be involved in approvals and other uh, partnerships elements as we move forward. So any questions I can answer? For development this large, is most of the fundraising on the shoulders of the Salina campus or do you get how much of this is a global case state initiative as opposed to well we'll help you but it's really your your so project they they are um, I would say it's probably about a 50-50 um, they will they'll provide the support and the effort um, where they can and what they need to um, within the university we have to identify people who have a passion for aviation and those can come from many different areas. But those, those uh, I think the individuals in, that are connected to the university are gonna be pretty small. And so that's where I think the, the bulk of this really lies on the Salina community and, and the individuals that we can identify within the Salina who wanna help with something of this magnitude as well as through partnerships at the state and the federal level. Um, the foundation is definitely willing and able to help where they can. I just think our prospects are pretty limited through K-State. Would you say there's a priority between the different parts of this plan? Uh, do you present 
presented them to is kind of in the order that of their significance, uh, the academic facility before the hangar or with the recruitment of the staffing and the scholarships, uh, <coughs> the seated chairs, would those be more important than the actual facility? Yeah, it's hard to put it in the chicken in the egg context because if you want to grow campus to have the revenue that supports some of the other development efforts, you need to, you know, focus some of that energy and effort on the staff development and the recruitment side and the other elements. On the other hand, we know that in today's environment, facilities matter to students. And from a recruitment perspective, in order to gather that students, we know that we have to, the number one reason students did not come to us and chose to go to another institution is because of the state of our facilities. Our interior of our buildings are really nice. You got to get into that interior to begin with. And then the land around us, if you've driven by our campus, it's just far too vast to be able to, to water and maintain and even to try to get it over to buffalo grass or another low, um, you know, maintenance type of environment for us is just, it's a intensive, um, you got to have a lot of money in order to do that. And so it's one of those things where we know we need to address this and it's critical for the recruitment side, but as we're continuing to grow, we also need to address this other side and, and make those elements. So I think it's more just about identifying the areas that people do want to contribute to and help and kind of taking them all in tandem. The hangar refresh project, I think, could be funded through a different mechanism than some of the other components. Um, that is something that Manhattan, the University of Manhattan, has a lot of um, different corporations that are co-located next to their building and other areas, which has helped them. I think that can be accomplished through a different funding mechanism of finding some corporate partners who want to be co-located here. So that takes some of that pressure off of that hangar initiative to where we can focus on some of these other ones within the community and within the within our donor base. But it, it's really, that's kind of our priority list, but it's really, really hard to separate them because we're doing this in the midst of a growth pattern, which is really good, but we quickly need to up our resources if we're gonna continue that growth pattern. What's the current enrollment on this line of campus? This year it's 672. Um, we've intentionally kept our enrollment small out of that need to be, be able to make sure, number one, we've got the resources that we need, and number two, that we can provide a safe environment for the training that we do now. Um, with this focus on shifting some of that to, to um, non-unmanned air areas, we can grow quickly in those areas. We've got capacity in a lot of the different parts of the programs in campus that we have to grow as much as we want to in the other areas. The manned aviation is just where we're starting to have to look at, do we need to only accept 80 students a year or can we grow quickly? The hard part about manned aviation, if you ordered a plane today, it would take about a year and a half, two years to receive it. And so we're, we're at that point where we're growing too quickly, but we're, we could get quickly into a really difficult situation if we don't manage that growth appropriately. Dr. Stark, you may not know the numbers off your head, but I recall that you were very successful in recruitment the prior cycle. You might share that success with the commission as well as kind of the, the progress made in simulators recently. Yeah, so our, our last year, our freshman class grew by about 30%, which is part of the reason why we're in the, the, the issue that we're in right now, because most of them came in professional pilot. Um, this year, our freshman class grew by 12%, which we were, we were incredibly happy with because most universities, community colleges and universities saw a decline. Manhattan declined about 8% this last year in their freshman class. And so we're excited with that growth that we're seeing. Um, uh, part of that is too a, a donation by a local community member um, helping us build out a, a simulation center for our flight program which um, will add one full training device, just like you're in the cockpit, so students can, can practice as if they are on an airline jet and get prepared for their career after that. And then two kind of panel uh, flight training devices, which help students realize and just kind of get familiar with what a jet aircraft looks like and what it's like to fly one of those as they come, go out into their career. And so that simulation center, the uh, that was pushed back a little bit due to the inability to get steel and stuff during the COVID transition, but that is set to be completed by uh, December 15th. And then the simulators will be here by the time that we start the spring semester for students to be able to use there. Is the housing uh, uprooted with repurposing of 
the uh, St. John's military campus. Yep. So w w what are you doing with the students now? Well, they, they are still there, and oh, they, they have indicated there. that they do have plans for that for that location, but they've indicated that if we need to stay there for one or two more years, two at the most, we can continue to do that until we figure out something else with the, the housing issues. And we've had several discussions with the chamber as well as the county economic development, um, as well as um, uh, Candace Wesleyan and KU and Salina Tech as well too. We're all kind of gathering, trying to figure out what our housing needs are for all the institutions in Salina. So we can, we can collectively build in a smart and strategic way as opposed to each of us going after it on our own. So you just have a shuttle from there to the campus? Or the um, all of the students had a car, but yes, we're prepared to do that if we need to. It's a pretty exciting time to be on campus despite everything else. I assume you've had some conversations with the, uh, the corporate uh, side of the in, that have interest in the programming you have uh, and do you have any uh, comments you can make about their willingness to shoulder part of the uh, expense of that you've got in the projects yes yeah, so it depends on the corporate partner um you know this will be the first time that our campus has really gone after partners who really need to give a significant amount of money um and so that's where this feasibility comes in feasibility study comes in to see do we have current relationships with, with industry partners who are capable of giving at this context level? Um, and if not, where do we need to develop the relationships? Um, and so we feel like at this point, there's probably four or five different corporations that we have partnerships with that are capable of giving in a significant way, one or two million towards this effort would be significant for us. Um, and so we feel like there's some, but we also feel like there's a lot of work that we need to do in order to develop some of those relationship to par partners. Got any kind of a timeline on the, where those conversations will start to show you some vision of where, you know, how that's all gonna work out? Yeah, we think that we'll have those, that kind of plan done by February is our intent, is to have that done to see what the capability is of the current partners and then develop a plan for how we wanna engage with partners afterwards as well. You said that you mentioned that this is just for me, kind of, uh, that a number of spin offs have happened. Some of the students have started their own business. Do you have any kind of inventory of that? I'd be really fascinated to see what some of the students have done. Yeah, we have three that are here in Salina, um, and they're all in the unmanned aircraft systems area. So there's three in that area. And then we've got, uh, I think we've got two others who kind of have developed national companies that have, one has been bought out now by somebody else, and another one who is working, I think, in Virginia hmm. um, as an entrepreneur. And it's just a new area that I think, as these new technologies continue to develop, we'll see more of that interest from our, from hmm. our students, and we want to be able to prepare them for a way to be successful if they've got that interest. Hmm. I believe there's probably a little bit of lag time for Commissioner Hodges, but I don't know if she, number one, is picking this up, and number two, whether she has any questions or comments. Actually, I think that the, if you guys can hear me okay, yes. the speaker phone is working great, and I just wanted to thank um, Alicia for the update, and um, I think that you guys have covered all of the, the, the questions and the comments that I had, and. I just think it's really exciting to see the partnerships between um, our local industries and this emerging technology and all of its different facets. So I just want to thank you for your presentation today. Thank you. Yeah, and likewise, it's an exciting time, obviously. A lot of, a lot of work ahead, but a lot of potential for not only K-State, K but also for the city of Salina. So. Okay. As a bit of a recap, you, Dr. Starkey touched on it, but I think this conversation started with the hangar refresh there on Beechcraft Road, and and understandably there was a conversation about needing to flesh that vision out further, and I think we've come a long way since then. Um, that's a lot of detail that you received today, and it looks like they have a pretty strong vision going forward. So. I think that vision's grown, too, yeah, it, obviously. So. <laughs> yeah, well, m much, of the, much of it through your investment in that study and so we greatly appreciate that we wouldn't be 
where we are right now without that investment. C could you tell me a little more about the high school program? Is that going to be in conjunction with all the major school mm -hmm. district just locally, or is it offered they, so, the students would have to be physically able to come onto campus? We're going to start it where it's locally, and the, the USD 305 board just approved that this last week at their board meeting. And so we, we plan to start a high school academy is what, what we're calling it. We're calling it the K-State Polycats Center for Advanced Technology Studies. And so students will have to be, um, it, it, we're not going to reduce our rigor any, so students will have to apply and go through an interview. Um, and then be selected for this program. We'll teach general educations as well as we have, we have five different associate degrees right now in aviation maintenance, business, applied business, um, unmanned aircraft systems, mechanical engineering technology, uh, electronic engineering technology, and then we also have one in um, com uh, web development, computer systems and web development, and then we have a certificate in advanced manufacturing. And so students can, uh, enroll in one of those degree programs, they'll spend half of their time at the high school, the other half at the our campus taking those courses, um, hopefully for two years during the last two years of high school, and then graduate with an associate's degree at the end of that time period. After this first year, after we get it settled, we do plan to expand that out to the rest of the, the state. We'll start at the state level through some virtual learning opportunities because they don't really have a lot of um, ability to take anything in the aviation industry throughout the state unless you're connected to a campus like ours. So we intend for it to be both. And we have looked at some property across the street from our campus and some other locations here in town that we can eventually kind of separate those a little bit and have a dedicated center, dedicated location for the high school students to come to. But again, we need to do some development work around that <laughs> to be able to make that happen. And would the intention be that several of these would then remain on campus to complete their bachelors? That would be the, the hope is that, you know, at least 50% would stay on and continue um, their efforts. The others, you know, could go on to a, a university of their choice, but we've made that pathway a little easier. We've also reduced the total cost for the students because our tuition rate um, right now, it's $372 for a traditional undergraduate student per credit hour. At the high school rate, it would be $99 a credit hour. So they can get this to make it affordable. They could build their career, make it accessible to them to go on for another institution as well too. Or like I said, we could reduce their total cost of an associate's degree if they do it well in high school and go on to their career immediately as well. So they'd be eligible for a scholarship just like any other college student? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great program. My daughter's participated in that. It makes me wonder, though, is that also extended to, like, El Saline and Southeast of Saline? And, you know, we've got a lot of smaller yeah. towns and school districts all around us. And all. Yeah, we will we'll <coughs> focus on this line of community first. Um, USD, the 305 and the, and the Sacred Heart will be our first focus. And then by year two, we'll start expanding that to others as well, too. Because mm -hmm. they travel in to, they bring a bus in for Salina Tech for students to go there and other elements so we can um, partner on that availability too. And I guess any parent would be asking, these students would still live at home though. <laughs> I, I guess I should make that a question, but. Uh, <laughs> There's probably some liability issues of bringing right? students on a campus, yeah. <laughs> okay, well thank you very much and yeah, appreciate you being here and, and good luck. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for the update. With that, we'll be back in here at 4 o'clock. Thank you. I'm disconnecting now. Thanks, Mayor okay. Hoffman. I'll call you back. Thanks.